all, I would like actually to thank the organizer for putting together such an amazing conference and all the papers that have been presented before and also after me for sharing your research uh, here. As you can see from the title, uh, this presentation is going to focus on the geological analysis of Mabric architecture in Bronze Age Crete, which is a component of my PhD research. And the main focus, the main goal of my research is looking at bricks as integral part of material culture and try to determine issues of labor organization, craft specialization in earth and architecture, and investigate the relationship between the natural and the human environment. These lines of research seem not to be quite new for people who have been working in uh, Egypt or the Near East or um, in other parts of the world, but in Crete, incredibly, are quite new. There are only two geoarchaeological um, projects that have been carried out in the past uh, on earthen building materials. One by Pamela Jerome in 1993 on the mud bricks from Palacastro, that is in the east point of the island, and it was presented yesterday. Um, the other is the work by Nodaru, Frederick and Hain on three sites in the eastern part of Crete. The other two work on earthen architecture by Maud de Volder and Gess Papamanoli are more macroscopic. Um, so we know a lot about construction technique, but nothing about uh, uh, the macro structure and uh, uh, the analysis of uh, the analytical uh, aspects of earthen architecture. Clearly, I thought it was a brilliant idea to make this part of my PhD project. And um, when uh, I start focusing, I noticed that earthen architecture has been reported from excavation since the beginning of the 20th century up uh, um, until practically the day before yesterday. So we know there is a uh, um, huge material that has been uh, understudied or not studied at all around the highland. So the research question that actually uh, were behind my research were if raw source material uh, used in fabric manufacture change over, over time from the early to the late occupation within a single site, I focus mainly on Minoan periods from the, from the early to the late Bronze Age. If the manufacturing process is changing within a single site or across the island. And finally, if the construction process is actually being affected through uh, these 2000 years. The sites I've been looking at uh, are around 10 sites, but three of them are the main case studies for uh, the geoarchaeological analysis. These sites are Malia, Gurnia, and Monastiraki. I try to include both uh, coastal and uh, peripheral centers, and the rationale behind the site selection was um, based on sites that have uh, a lengthy period of occupation, so from the early to the late bronze, sites that present um, earthen architecture, and not just in residential structures, but also in non-residential structures such as palaces, so public buildings, and workshops that usually are defined in uh, Minoan archaeology as mixed type of context, as you have the workshop or on the ground, lay, on the ground floor and uh, residential uh, floors on the first and the second. I also choose sites that have excavation ongoing, so I was able to match um, my results with the stratigraphic information, which is important in any archaeological study. Just to give you a short rundown of the chronology that uh, we will be looking at, uh, mainly focus on protopalatial and neopalatial samples, so Middle Bronze and Late Bronze Age, because it's where 80% of my material is coming from, but we also have some Early Bronze Age uh, uh, fragments that have been analyzed. So, going into the methodology, um, the research was based on an interdisciplinary methodology with a combination of technique, um, architectural analysis and Ethnoarchaeology, or I should correct it actually to geo ethnoarchaeology, have been carried out. I will not present them here, I will just refer it to them in 
combination to the geological methodology and results which I will be presenting and they are based on uh, XRF, XRD, FTR, SCM and thin section petrography. I would have loved to do some uh, micromorphology but my permit didn't allow for it so I had to deal with um, some issues on that, um, on that part of the research. So I've been looking at a total of um, 12,500 fragments that have been recorded and analyzed uh, all of them microscopically, microscopically with a stereoscopic microscope. And sorry. And uh, of these, then 120 were analyzed through geoarchaeological methods. And of these, the part from Monastiraki are coming from uh, the storage unit of the court building, from the workshop here, and from the domestic area. From the site of Malia, the samples are coming from uh, the palace, and these samples are from the early to the late bronze, from uh, Quartier Mu, that is fo mainly focused on the early and middle bronze, and from Quartier Delta. Again, we have occupation from the early to the late Bronze Age. And finally, from the site of Gurnia, where I look at uh, in the sample um, mud bricks from the palace, from the block A and the five residential unit, and the other 10 residential unit in the northwest uh, area, that is the ongoing excavation. So the metal workshop, pit house, and the northeast area that was first excavated by Harriet Boyd in 1904 and has been reopened in 2014 and um, we finished excavation last year. I should also um, comment on the fact that uh, one of the sites, Monastiraki, present actually level of early bronze and middle bronze, but we have a final destruction and we don't have reoccupation during the late bronze. I still include it in the analysis because of the richness of uh, the material culture and regarding earthen architecture. So what I'm going to present are mainly the geochemical results and um, the, I use uh, um, not uh, benchtop XRF but portable XRF because I needed a technique that was non-destructive as the uh, sample size was quite limited so that was one of my research limitations and I wanted to run more than one technique on each sample and this was one of the main reasons why I focused on portable XRF. Then I interpreted the data through um, multivariate statistics. Here you see the principal component analysis and the elements that have been mapped. Um, I mapped them through R, through a script that I adapted and coded. And you see that uh, the principal component analysis is explaining actually 63% of the total variation and uh, the confidence ellipse has been set at 95%. Clearly, uh, the image is uh, quite clear. You see there is quite uh, a, chemical, a strict chemical fingerprint for each side. You don't have any overlap between uh, uh, the three different case studies. And that is actually a good reflection on what you have in uh, the geoarchaeological analysis and the geological analysis of the area around the site, where you notice that there is a good match between um, the soil that has been used in the mud brick and the type of sediment around the site and we could pinpoint that um, raw source material procurement not only it's local but it's happening within a two three kilometers radius uh, from each site so that information was particularly important when we analyzed the economics of um, the construction process because then we could determine that it's less than a day walk to get to the raw sources. Here you see the PCA divided by periods, so um, there is a clearly overlap uh, of raw sources between the three periods. The cluster is slightly uh, tighter for the neopalatial period and that is also matched by the macroscopic analysis. We see a progressive standardization in measurement, for instance, and when we do and analyze the PCA by context, we notice that what maybe we should have been expecting, so there is higher variability in domestic architecture, 
and you have quite a tight cluster in uh, public uh, architecture and uh, workshops environment. And this is clearly indicated that um, raw sources for these two specific contexts were quite uh, constant, not only over time, but also within um, each single site. These results then have been also compared through and um, cross-referenced through other methodology. One was the triangular scattergram following the methodology set by Morgenstern and Redmond. So I mapped them with um, rubidium, iron and strontium. And again, you can see there is quite a tight cluster for Monastiraki and Malia, whereas we have a wider scatter of points for Gurnia, which is a reflection of the higher variability that you have in the Gurnia uh, region, the geological variability, and that is well represented also in the XRD. So as the other two sites, uh, the XRD was quite boring really, you just have the quartz peak and you have the light. Here you can see that it's a little bit more lively and you have uh, presence of dolomite and calcite in almost uh, all the samples. One other aspect that I was interested in looking at, uh, it was uh, the fact that um, there was no current academic agreement if the bricks we were looking at, uh, they were fire or they were simply sun dried. So um, I thought it was important to actually address it and uh, it was important to determine that if they have undergone more than one uh, conflagration. And FTR showed the absence of uh, structural water and the shift of the main clay peaks. And there are a lot of research that has been conducted on this specific aspect um, by Francesco Berna. And I think it was also quite important to determine that uh, all the bricks uh, that uh, I analyzed were actually burned at different temperature. You have a minimum of 300 degrees up to 1000. You have bricks that were completely vitrified. And here I just wanted to show the initial phase of the bottom, you see, of vitrification of this brick. And um, it was also important to analyze which type uh, of, uh, to address the manufacturing uh, question, which type uh, of um, tempering um, agents were used uh, during manufacturing. And we have uh, the presence of grog, we are the presence of quartz, and it also appears that um, sand was used as a tempering <coughs> agent as well as a vegetal, traditional vegetal temper that is also reflected here by the void. And I'm going to come back to the, um, to the issues of which type of vegetal temper was used in Minoan and mud bricks, because the type of voids we have are actually consistent with uh, a vegetal temper that we don't see in the same area in the Neolithic, where we have uh, uh, mainly chaff from barley and wheat, and we don't have also in the Iron Age, where we have the same type of vegetal temper. Actually, what was used, it was a specific uh, species of seagrass, Posidonia oceanica, and the huge amount of teeny tiny marine gastropod that we could recognize inside the bricks, um, we could find them because they are attached to this uh, seagrass and they are incorporated then in uh, the main matrix. Another question that um, I wanted to address was if it was possible to determine specific recipe within each single site and uh, analyzing the coarse and fine fraction over um, over the site occupation, we could look at on a, this density graph, you have specific recipe that are emerging and you don't uh, have that completely standardized at the beginning of uh, the protopalatial period, but just already by the end, by the middle of the protopalatial, so uh, by the middle of the Bro middle Bronze Age up to the late Bronze Age, you have standardization of uh, recipes. Here is just uh, yeah the teeny tiny shells that are attached uh, to the seagrass. And um, of all I discussed up until now, the most interesting part of my research actually came down to this, to the integrated archaeobotany analysis that I did 
on the Magris and on the reasons behind the use of this specific um, um, sea grass in Madrid manufacturing was just an opportunistic choice. So people were just using it because it was readily available and they didn't have to wait around for the threshing. It was available all year around or there were different reasons for using it and um, laboratory tests actually proved that sea grasses improve not only mechanical properties of earthen architecture but uh, also thermal insulation properties so um, the performance uh, enhancement was at least of two degree and that uh, if you think that then sea grasses were used also in the ceiling structure that is quite a lot for a earthen construction and we could also notice that uh, the sea grasses were present not just in Malia or in Gurnia, but also in Monastiraki, that is uh, 35 kilometers far from uh, the coastline. So sea grasses were actually used in uh, the Madrid architecture, they were transported there and used then in the ceiling structure and uh, in the Madrid. Another issue that came out looking at the vegetal temper and looking at the density of vegetal temper was the fact that you need less sea grasses than straw um, in the recipes and uh, sea grasses were progressively used um, in combination to straw uh, in the early Bronze Age and in the beginning of the Middle Bronze Age and then progressively they overcome and they become the main vegetal temper. And in Monastiraki, that stop, uh, the, um, the site occupation stop uh, in the protopalatial period, so in the Middle Bronze Age, you can see that the combination of straw and sea grasses, you have a lot more vegetal temper in the brick than other sites like uh, Malia and Gurnia, where they abandon straw and they just use uh, sea grasses. So, what is this all telling us about uh, manufacturing technique? It's pointing at a progressive standardization, uh, looking at coarse fine fraction, looking at the type of temper used, a progressive standardization of brick recipes over time. Uh, it's also pointing out a minuan characteristic of mud brick architecture, like the presence of sea grasses, and looking also at the earthen structure, ceiling earthen structure at tiles that have been used at the same period, we notice um, a sharing, a community of raw source material, procurement, that is always happening within the three, kilo, three kilometer radius uh, from the center of the site. So we draw up some conclusion, which are pinpointing on the fact that craft specialization is happening in, um, already in the protopalatial period, is happening in earthen architecture, which disprove the previous uh, theory that uh, mud brick was just made uh, by some unskilled workforce uh, throughout the um, Minoan period. And finally, I think uh, it contributes to see the importance of using geoarchaeological technique in analyzing earthen architecture to address issues uh, like labor organization or craft uh, specialization. And if you give me another moment, I just would like to thank some people, which I never got the opportunity to do, one of them is Lisa, clearly, that she was my supervisor for an year. And um, special thanks to Takis Karkanas, the director of the Wiener Lab, uh, Paul Goldberg and Vasily Kilikoglu, which I worked with during this uh, project, and all the people who contributed to, to the project. Thank you.